Best two weeks of his life. <laughs> he went to a great university, but uh, never saw the inside of a classroom. We're good. Thank you. Okay, so we're back here, colleagues, and this is our first public hearing at Council, all of Regional Council. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the virtual public hearing. Uh, the order of events for this virtual hearing is similar to a regular public hearing. We'll start with a staff presentation. We'll give the applicant an opportunity to present. Uh, and then normally we would go to a public hearing speakers list. However, for tonight's hearing, no speakers have signed up. As a reminder to those watching from home, in order to have signed up as a speaker, the deadline was 430 to not today, the day prior to the hearing. So yesterday. So colleagues, that's our order of business with which you're familiar in a different context. Um, and so we're going to start with a presentation. And uh, I see we have the uh, uh, always entertaining Paul Sampson with us. Paul, welcome. Uh, nice to see you virtually. Thank you for joining us and I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me OK? We got you. OK, um, so slide number one. Do you see slide number one, the public hearing case number 21916? No. OK. That'll come up, I assume that staff will bring that up. OK. I'll just wait till that's uh, ready. OK, we see the slides. Now we're back to Councillor Hensby and Councillor Walker and everybody else. All right, making progress. There you go, Paul. OK, uh, so is, uh, slide number one is just the cover slide. Public hearing case number 21916. And this is for a municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw amendment and a development agreement for a site at 3514 Joseph Howe Drive, Halifax. Uh, next slide, slide number two. Do you see that? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so this is the uh, proposal. Uh, the applicant is Bank Investments, uh, and the application is also by Zwicker Zareski, Architects and Planners, and Leiden Lynch Architects. Uh, location 3514 Joseph Howe Drive, and the proposal is for Municipal Planning Strategy Land Use Bylaw Amendments uh, for uh, Area A of the planned Dutch Village Road area and a development agreement for uh, Civic 3514 Joseph Howe Drive. Uh, so next slide, slide number three. This slide shows the general location of the site. Uh, it's outlined in red. Uh, the site fronts on Joseph Howe Drive opposite Scott Street. And just moving on to slide number four. This is the existing uh, one story building on the site, uh, which uh, contains several commercial uses. And slide number five, uh, is that the slide that's up right now? No, we're one slide ahead, Liam, there. Okay, slide number five, uh, site context. Uh, so the site fronts on Chain of Lakes Trail, which abuts Joseph Howe Drive. The site also has a small amount of frontage on Percy Street along its northern boundary, as you see here. Uh, there is uh, mixed commercial and multi-unit residential development to the north of the site and also to the west and south. And there's mainly low and medium density residential uses across Joseph Howe Drive to the east. Uh, so just moving along to slide number six. That's also site context. Um, this is an aerial view of the site looking south. Uh, hopefully that is what you see on your screens. <laughs> uh, the site abuts St. Lawrence Place development to the immediate south. So slide number seven, next slide. Um, the, uh, just to give a little background on the planned Dutch Village Road area, um, the planned Dutch Village Road process uh, began, I believe, in 2015, and it was approved by council in October of 2016. 
and it brought in new uh, policies and zoning regulations for the uh, for this area you see on the map. Um, the uh, the focus was on built form and human scaled uh, and and pedestrian friendly development. Uh, with buildings oriented close to the street and uh, parking, uh, surface parking to the side and rear of properties. Um, the, uh, it also brought in um, the concept of uh, low rise street walls, which you see in much of downtown Halifax and uh, the upper portions of buildings are stepped back from the street. Um, so this site is within area A. On this slide, the site is uh, outlined in red and uh, the area A is shown in brown. So next slide, slide number eight. Uh, this just shows examples of existing development in area A of the planned Dutch Village Road area. So this shows properties on Joseph Howe Drive and also on uh, Dutch Village Road. Too. Uh, moving along to uh, next slide, uh, slide number nine. The, uh, in terms of planning policy, this site is within the Fairview second uh, Fairview area secondary planning strategy. The site's designated commercial, and uh, the commercial designation allows a, a variety of, uh, of both commercial and residential uses, so mixed use buildings. Uh, it allows some development as a right, uh, typically low rise and medium rise development, and then high rise buildings would be through the development agreement process in area A only. Uh, so next slide, slide number 10. Um, the zoning of the site is C2C zone. And um, so the zoning allows, uh, like indicated, it allows mixed use buildings. It allows low and mid rise buildings as of right, just through the permitting process. And uh, again, buildings are required to be close to the street uh, as opposed to set back um, between three and five stories high and up to 25.5 meters. Um, so high rise buildings above 25.5 meters would be through the development agreement process. And this is the process that we're, we're going through here this evening. Um, the 12 stories was the maximum height that was considered appropriate for this area uh, in planning policy. So, uh, next slide, slide number 11. In terms of the proposed municipal planning strategy amendments, um, the the amendments include um, changes just to area A of the, of the plan uh, Dutch Village Road area. Um, the, mi the, the really minor increases in height, um, in this case it's to allow buildings up to 42 meters and also no, no higher than 12 stories. And then the street wall heights, similarly a minor increase up to 20 meters in some cases, but a maximum of five stories. And, and those were the number of stories that were originally intended by the initial amendments that took place back in 2016. Um, also, these amendments clarify that uh, there will not be a building street wall on, on Percy Street, which is the uh, which abuts the site on the northern property line. Um, so moving along to slide 12. This is the proposed uh, rendering. The proposal is for a 12 story mixed use development. Uh, it includes ground floor commercial retail units and residential apartments above. Um, and this shows, you see in this image, it shows the five stories and the, and the 12 story portions are set back from the street. Um, the, uh, there's also a combination of surface and underground parking in the development. Uh, slide 13, next slide shows the proposed front elevation and this proposal includes uh, again a five-story street wall, two seven-story residential towers above the building podium and, and set back from the street, overall height of 12 stories containing approximately 324 residential units. Uh, next slide, slide number 14. This is the proposed site plan. Uh, it shows the site and the ground floor uh, elevation or ground floor uh, layout of the buildings. It makes use of the two existing driveways that are on the site now uh, off of Joseph Howe Drive. Um, the commercial retail units will face the street. Again, they'll be cl very close to the street and uh, they'll also be uh, ab about the Chain of Lakes Trail. Um, you can see on the left side of the site, the commercial retail unit on the left will include a drive-through. Um, and that is, 
on the south side of the building. And then the two residential towers, as you see here in the back of the site, are, are set back and behind the commercial. Next slide, slide number 15. Uh, the landscaped areas are proposed on the rooftops. So this shows the rooftop of level six, uh, as well as uh, there will be landscaping on the tower uh, rooftops. And on the ground level, there will be landscaping along the, uh, the site perimeter. Uh, next slide, number 16. Uh, this shows the proposed exterior building materials. So the materials include a combination of glass curtain wall and, and glass window walls, uh, as well as aluminum panels and uh, porcelain or precast panels. So there's some options there in terms of the building materials that uh, will eventually be used. Uh, next slide, number 17. In terms of public engagement, the level engagement was consultation. We had a, a public information meeting, uh, posted information on our website, uh, mailed letters, and we had and there's a sign on the site. Um, in terms of feedback from the community, uh, there wasn't a lot of feedback. Um, there was a lot of uh, involvement. There was a, a large mail out and a, a large number of web page views. Uh, in terms of meeting attendees, there was just uh, approximately six and, and just one letter received. Uh, in terms of comments back, um, there, there were positive comments with regards to the building design and appearance. And uh, the, there were a couple of questions about the pedestrians uh, now being able to cut through the site to actually walk through the site and that's no longer going to be able to happen. Uh, also, there was uh, just a question with regards to the building uh, timing of building instruction. Uh, next slide, number 18. And in terms of rationale, um, the height increases are fairly minor. Um, we are also putting in place uh, a clear identification of the number of stories so that the heights can't exceed those number of stories as well. Um, so there would be no increase in what was originally tended as part of the original amendments. Um, and also um, there is no, no resulting uh, increase in floor area uh, from these amendments. And the, the purpose of the amendments was really due to uh, the lack of flexibility in the regulations currently when you're dealing with sloping site conditions and uh, rooftop elements and things like that. Also, the ground floor heights are required. The commercial ground floor is required to be 4.5 meters. So that's uh, another uh, issue that the applicant has to deal with. So. Um, in terms of the Percy Street frontage, it was never intended that the Percy Street would actually have um, a building street wall and a building right up to the edge of Percy Street because it's it's quite a, it's quite a, a bit higher. That portion of the site is higher than the rest of the site. So uh, these uh, these amendments just clarify that Percy Street will not have a building uh, butting right up against it. But instead, the building in, in that location will be kind of like a side property line and, and set back from the, uh, the property line at Percy Street. Okay, next slide, number 19. So this is just a summary of the proposed development agreement. Uh, in terms of height, again, it clarifies 12 stories and uh, the street wall of five stories. In terms of permitted uses, um, it allows for the mix of commercial and apartments. Uh, in this case, we're also allowing the possibility of second floor commercial uses uh, above the ground floor, um, but that may not happen. Also, a drive through in this case is permitted in combination with the building itself. Um, the, currently, the C2C zone does not permit drive like standalone drive throughs. Uh, but we felt it was appropriate in this case to to allow it through the development agreement process as part of a larger uh, development. Uh, next slide, number 20. And this is just a, again continued. Uh, the development agreement looks at building and site design and, and the street wall design. In this case, it is a long facade that is located close to the street. Um, so the street wall is uh, segmented and uh, has a series of recesses and projections and, and vertical breaks, which um, you know meet, meets the policy, can be considered to meet the policy in terms of the design of the street wall. 
landscaping. So there's landscaping on different levels, including at the ground level uh, along the surrounding the, the perimeter of the development and, and internal to the development. Um, and uh, the development agreement also specifies the materials that will be used. And uh, in terms of non-substantive amendments, it's it's minor things like signs and uh, changes to parking requirements and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so moving along to slide number 21. In terms of process, uh, so this is a joint public hearing between Regional Council and uh, Halifax and West Community Council for both the uh, the Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw Amendments and also the Development Agreement. So Regional Council is responsible for the MPS and LUB amendments. Um, the following uh, tonight, if Council were to approve, then the province has to review those amendments and then a supplementary report would go back to Community Council at a later date. Um, so moving on to the next slide in terms of recommendations, uh, we recommend that uh, Council approve the proposed amendments to the MPS and LUB as so out in attachments A and B of the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. OK. Thank you, uh, uh, Paul. A couple of questions of clarification at this point, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, just a, a quick question, Paul. I'm just wondering about the um, the uh, the high. I don't want to call it a high rise, but the, uh, the the higher story building that's a little further down the road as you head towards Dutch Village Road. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell me how tall that one is? Uh, you sure. mean the the one just to the south of the site, uh, St. Lawrence Place? Correct, yes. I, I believe that's 13 stories. I, okay. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. There's actually two buildings on that site. Um, there's um, this, the low rise, I believe, five stories uh, along Joseph Howe. And then behind it is the larger, I believe it's at least 12, if not 13 floors. Gotcha. No, I'm thinking of that one that's uh, that's tucked in behind. So it's around around the same height than 12, 13. That's correct. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Paul, for the presentation. Just two, two questions. Um, you referenced the um, street, uh, the pedestrian focus policy and the feeling that this one meets meets that. Um, despite it being a very long, long facade that really doesn't have a lot, I mean, it's the same design approach along the whole expanse of it. I was hoping you could expand a little bit more on that, on how um, staff reached the conclusion that that uh, meets the criteria. And then the other question I uh, had was just uh, the elevation change. Um, could you, it was just a passing reference about, about that. Could you uh, expand a little bit more as to what you, mean by that in terms of um, what it means for the developer. Um, as far as, I mean, I haven't spent a great deal on this site. I turned around in it uh, on the weekend going out to Hatfield Farms. It didn't feel like a big sloped area to me. No, so I'll, I'll uh, actually, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll handle that second question first. So the, um, the in terms of the, the difficulties that the applicant had with the site, um, there is uh, a little bit of a grade increase from Joseph Howe Drive up into the site. So, so if you drive in, you're driving up a bit, and then and then it flattens out. Um, and the in terms of the height calculation at the moment, it's it's calculated at the at the Joseph Howe Drive um, uh, level. And uh, the other issues that kind of go along with that are the rooftop issues, but also the ground, the required ground floor height of 4.5 meters, which is about 14 and a half feet, I believe. And so all of those things combined pose some difficulties in terms of achieving 12 stories. It actually couldn't be done. And um, but the original intent was to have 12 story buildings in total in this location. Um, a similar problem with the street wall. It's difficult to get five stories when, when you're dealing with those grade level issues and, and things like that. So that uh, hopefully that explains it a little bit uh, better. Um, in terms of the design of the street wall, um, so there's a number of things that factor into that. Um, the, the the building requirement is that it be 
located close to the street. And the plan and strategy talks in general terms about kind of essentially breaking up the mass of the building um, and uh, and also having um, a minimum of 65% of the site's frontage um, with with a building on it. So the 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 uh, the minimum amount of of like uh, I guess street frontage that the building is supposed to take up is is 65%. So either way you look at it, it ends up with uh, you end up with a large long facade. Uh, facing Joseph Howe Drive. So there's, I guess, a couple of ways you can deal with that sort of thing in terms of breaking up the mass. You can uh, try to do something different in segments every so many feet. And, and a good example of that would be Bishop's Landing, the north facade of Bishop's Landing, which I believe that project was also done by Leiden Lynch Architects. But it's just a different way to break up the mass. A very long building, but they chose to make every say approximately 100 feet of building look different from the next. In this case, the way the architect uh, dealt with um, kind of, um, you know, dealing with the mass of, of the, and the, and the width of the building was to uh, break it up in a different way and uh, have a series of, um, you know, recesses and projections. So poke parts that stick out a bit, balconies that are recessed, and also um, breaks in the facade that are not quite vertical, but they they kind of wind their way up the facade. And it might be better explained by the uh, the architect himself, who I, be I believe is going to present. Um, but so we looked at that, and we looked at their analysis or their explanation of how they're dealing with the facade. And and we felt that it meets the it's another way you can do it and it, and it meets the planning strategy in in that regard. So sorry for the long winded uh, answer, uh, Mr. Mayor. No apologies on my end, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for the detailed answer, Paul. Okay, you're welcome. Well, you planners just love to talk about this stuff, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor uh, Russell. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the presentation. That was uh, interesting and helpful. Um, I'm wondering, has there been any consideration, has there been any discussion at all about affordable housing units or a density bonusing or anything like that with this? There's no policy in place to require the density bonusing in this case, and I know the center plan is looking that, and, and we're you know, we're basically across the street from the center plan area. Uh, we're just on the boundary uh, on the west side. So, um, but in this case, no. Uh, and I think maybe, um, maybe the uh, you know, after center plan, it might get to a point where we're looking at the the suburban areas. But at the moment, we don't have. So for this project, there was nothing in place to uh, to look at affordable housing. Okay. So yeah, and I wasn't wondering if it was required just had it actually happened had the developer brought it up so thank you very much for that and uh, okay. thank you for your help out out here with uh, the other development in Sackville. Well. Thank you Councillor Nicol. Thank you and uh, Councillor Austin sort of asked some questions as to what I was you know the long large facade like you said Paul and um, it'll be interesting when it's actually built if you can actually make it look like Bishop's Landing but that would be a much more much more uh, co you know compatible I would say so I look forward to hearing the architect but you mentioned the landscaping plan and I, when I look at the picture that you presented I didn't quite get a feel for any landscaping I saw a large building um, the trail that runs before it and uh, some grass and much uh, much asphalt so I just wondered like what was the plan for the landscaping for the landscaping so Mr. Mayor there's there's uh, in terms of landscaping there's there's a little bit on the ground floor um, and uh, it's mainly around the perimeter of the site but uh, also some of the internal driving areas um, much of the landscaping is rooftop landscaping, especially uh, above the sixth, uh, sorry, above the fifth floor. So the, the podium rooftop is, is that includes a, a large area for tenants and it will be accessible. So that is shown, uh, I forget which shy slide it's shown on, just one second now. Uh, 
I would have to go back here and just double check. Slide 15. 15, 15 shows the landscaped areas. But those those will be um, primarily for tenants and their guests. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other questions of clarification, so uh, we will. Uh, what's that? Yeah. Uh, we will uh, open the uh, public hearing, invite the applicant to um, address council. Who's going to present on behalf of the applicant? That's me, Mr. Mayor, Keith Tufts. Keith, okay, Keith Tufts, welcome, sir. Uh, and if you would just sort of give direction on the slides to the staff, we'll move the slides as appropriate and uh, we'll send it off to you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Savage and councillors. Uh, I'm Keith Tufts, uh, the principal for Law and Lynch Architects, and I'm here with Alex Aleph from the bank group. Um, Hello, is everyone. the first slide up, the rendering? Slide 12 is up. Thank you. The design intent for this 12-story multi-use building is to provide a high-quality, well-designed retail and residential environment to create and serve a pedestrian-friendly streetscape experience along Joseph Howe Drive at the existing Chain of Lakes Trail. The design reflects a multitude of movement and mobility, reflecting the history of rail directly in front of the site, as well as the Chain of Lakes Trail for pedestrian and bikes and of course, Joseph Howe Drive itself, which is a major traffic corridor. So we tried to catch that movement and mobility in the facade facing the street. In terms of massing, the design can be rationalized as three major components. The first floor retail designed to engage with the existing pedestrian corridor, a floating four-story residential podium above that retail, and two rear, rear towers rising another seven stories to a total of 12 above that podium. These three components inform the massing of the building as a base, a middle, and a top. The podium itself, or the street wall that Paul referenced, consists of a five-story glass box with continually glazed retail space on the ground and four levels of randomized protruding residential balconies and bedrooms above. The retail spaces and residential balconies above engage and interact with the streetscape, creating a strong community presence and opportunities for more eyes on the street. At the base ground level, there are three individual retail spaces you can see in the rendering with integrated sinus, signage, excuse me, continuous glazing, individual entries, and a street level patio space to support a vibrant pedestrian oriented street at the Chain of Lakes trails. Above levels two and five feature residential units with randomized protruding residential balconies and bedrooms that cantilever out from the five story glass box in what appears to be a randomized pattern that doesn't repeat across the entire facade. The alternating, the alternating five foot cantilevers of the hovering balconies create a sheltered yet dynamic condition for the sidewalk below. What we attempted to do was have the building be different every 10 feet along that street wall. The seven story rear towers are a simplified interpretation of the randomized podium pattern, creating a dialogue between the two forms. Using repeated tower floor plates to simplify and streamline the aesthetic of the two masses ensures that the tower profiles are minimized and the focus of the design remains with the street wall at the pedestrian scale of the podium. The size of the uh, entire development, and Paul has mentioned some of these figures, but I'll mention them again to make sure they're all there. The total size is 384,000 square feet approximately. Uh, of that, 361,000 is residential and 23,000 is retail. Um, the podium uh, is 20 meters high top and the towers at 12 stories, uh, all residential is 42 meters. Kind of the next slide, please. Slide 14 is live. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about landscaping. Uh, this is shows you some of the landscaping at the ground level as you come in under the building through uh, 
through the street wall to get access to the exterior parking as well as the parking for the underground. Um, the site is uh, 100,000 square feet and the resulting FAR from the development is 3.84. Uh, next slide, please. Slide 15 is live. So this uh, shows more of the landscaping, but this is now on top of the street wall. So we're basically taking everything up to the top of the five-story podium and created an amenity space for resident gatherings and activities, providing exceptional views of the basin, Bedford Basin and the trail, and also directly featuring vegetated areas, walkways and covered and non-covered uh, areas uh, for seating for the uh, amenity of the residents of the development. Next slide, please. Gives you a sense of the units that are in the uh, podium and the towers. And in total, there's 324 uh, units. 224 are two bedroom and 100 are one bedroom. We also have two stories of underground parking and I'd ask for the next slide, please. Slide 27 is live. So we have uh, two stories of underground parking. This is uh, level two, I believe. And uh, we feature a total of 414 parking spaces uh, on the development. 360 of them are underground. Uh, can I have the next slides, please? Slide 28 is live. So this is the other level of parking and included in the totals I gave you previously, but also of note is that there's 170 parking spaces for bicycles and 168 are class A and the amenity provided in the underground parking has storage uh, at the front of each and every uh, uh, parking, parking space. So in addition to a place to park, a place to store uh, outside of your actual unit. Next slide, please. Slide 16 is live. And this is uh, this is a slide that explains some of the materials we're going to use. The intent is to be all high quality and a combination of curtain wall glazing, precast concrete, architectural metal, and architectural stone panels are anticipated for the design. Uh, next slide, please. Slide 12 is live. That's my presentation and thank you all for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tufts. Uh, anybody else speaking on behalf of the proponent tonight? That's it? Uh, yes, we have Alex here to answer any questions as necessary. But it's uh, I'll leave my comments for, for the end. Thank you, Alex. Good evening, uh, Mr. Halef. Um, good, good. Okay, is there any um, is there any uh, questions of clarification there? I see no names. There's no, nobody with questions of clarification. Then uh, we would look for a motion to close the public hearing. The staff will stay with us um, and we can move to a motion. Move to close public hearing. Second. Second, Councilor Cleary. Amen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, we'll ask Paul to stay with us. Uh, Councilor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the motion is that Halifax Regional Council adopt the proposed amendments to the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy and the Halifax Main Use Bylaw, as cited in attachments A and B of the staff report dated. February the 12th, 2020, to enable a street wall height up to five stories and overall building heights up to 12 stories within area A of the Dutch Village Road area by development agreement, I so move. Second, Councillor Carson. Second by Councillor Carson. Councillor Walker, anything on that? Uh, yes, um, I've only had one inquiry about it and uh, I haven't heard from uh, the lady since. And, uh, this is about the third or fourth design they had for the site. And uh, 
I really like the design in that uh, I know the street wall height is five stories, but every 10 feet it changes and I think it is rather unique. And it's not like Bishop's Landing, but it is, it's its own building and sort of like that design and uh, we'll see where we go from there. And uh, it, 12 stories are allowed here by DA and that's what they've asked for. So I have no trouble supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> and I, I'm going to support this, but I'm going to support it because the uh, what's being asked of us right now as regional council is much more narrow. We're being asked to approve the uh, MPS and the LUB amendments, which are pretty minor in scope, really, in the scale of it. The hard work is really at uh, her, uh, the community yeah. council where the development agreement okay. will be considered with all its massing and everything like that. And uh, you know, as much as I'm going to support the regional one, if I was sitting in your shoes at uh, Halifax and West, uh, I would not support this project based on what I have to see. Um, the street wall on this is one long glass facade. People don't, um, that street wall experience is important as you go up the building and the most important level is that ground floor level and that's the level that is basically just empty space on this. All the architecture in my view begins on floor number two and so I think they've, uh, this is one of these things that looks good in a rendering, but I'm very far from convinced it will be uh, it will be a space that really adds to the streetscape in the when it's actually built. Um, so I would encourage colleagues to take a second look at it when it comes time for the development agreement. I think a few tweaks would make this really something fantastic. Um, but that street wall approach to me is we could do better. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there's nobody else to speak to it, are we ready for the question? Question. Are we doing the vote the same way? I call the names. Okay, Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason. Councillor Smith. In favor. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zerowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. I'm in favor. Deputy Mayor. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Yes. And the mayor is for it as well. So that's uh, unanimous of all those that are here. So that uh, motion uh, passes. Is there anything else, John, that we need to do here? Or Cheryl, we're done. So that uh, motion has passed. Um, I think we're done there. Okay. So, councillors, we are going to leave the public hearing. Uh, I thank uh, Paul, uh, thank you, uh, Keith, as well, and thank you, Alex, for being part of our first uh, controversial public uh, uh, hearing tonight and uh, long debate. And we will now be leaving this public. This, uh, this, uh, Mr. Mayor, what? I apologize. It's Laura. You can actually stay in this meeting and oh. uh, conduct the rest of your agenda. Staff who are required have been added to this meeting for you. Okay. All right. That makes it easier. Okay. So we will go right back to our where we were, which was on the secondary suites and backyard suites supplementary report. Um, Councillor. Cleary. So the, the speakers we have are Councillor Cleary, Councillor Hensby, Hensby Austin. Okay. Uh, no, so I heard. Austin. I was on the list too, Tim. So Councillor Cleary, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, yeah, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Mayor. So we're uh, wrapping my mind around this. We're back on 11.1.11 11 uh, secondary and backyard suites. Uh, so if, if folks recall where we ended our discussion, I'm kind of confused by the uh, the tone and tenor of the discussion before we, we paused. 
because I remember counselors hammering staff to get on to public hearings. Uh, oh my God, like if, if Lunenburg, if, if Wolfville, if these places can do public hearings, surely we can do them too. Um, and so I'm quite confident that our staff will be able to come up with a way that will work for a public hearing uh, of this magnitude. And I'm assuming we're going to have more than Councillor Austin mentioned, seven or eight people at the, the, the um, Harbor East uh, public hearing. Uh, I'm assuming we'll have dozens or hundreds uh, for this one. And I'm completely happy to leave it in staff's hands uh, in terms of figuring out what the appropriate date is and how we'll actually conduct it in a way that uh, is sufficient. Uh, Councillor Stretch mentioned, you know, what happens if we get kicked off and how do we come back in? Again, I don't, we, as we've done for these meetings, you know, quite often we've paused to see if we can get someone back into a meeting. So for a public hearing, obviously that's required. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be able to do it. Many people will question the timing. If you remember back in January, pre-COVID, which seems like 10 years ago now, um, the discussion we were having around this, we were all gung-ho. We wanted to add not just the R1 single family units, we wanted to add the townhouses, we wanted to add the duplexes, we wanted to make sure these folks could have secondary and backyard suites. And that's why we have the supplementary report because we were pushing staff to add extra. And so we are in a housing crisis. We have a, 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 a rental vacancy rate of 1%. We have house prices that even with COVID continue to increase. We are pricing people out of the market, both in terms of uh, buying and renting. We committed to helping in terms of the poverty strategy uh, and the housing and homeless partnership to actually putting more units out there. We are in a crisis, folks, when it comes to housing options. Um, in terms of you know, Councillor Stretch asking like, what's so important about this and, and can't we wait? COVID's gonna be with us for a long time. We can't put all the business of our municipality on hold for six months, a year, two years. We, we need to get stuff done. And I have full confidence in our planning staff, in our clerks, in our legal staff, that we'll be able to put together when appropriate, the kind of formula for a public hearing that'll be necessary. So I'm happy to pass this at first reading schedule a public hearing when appropriate by our staff and, and move this forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Who was second? Councilor Hensby? Sure. No, who was the next speaker? Oh, Councilor Hensby and then Councilor Outfit. Austin. Very much, Mr. Mayor. Just a, couple, just a few points. Um, you know, losing cell, losing our internet capacity, we can still call in on a phone and keep connected. So we have a phone as a backup plan if we lose our internet connection. Uh, my other concern is the timing. Um, we only have six meetings left until the next election date. That's J July 21st and August 18th, and we have four dates in September still on our calendar. The 1st, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. So the question will be is when do you put it in there? Uh, in regards to a public education time, I think we need, you're going to need the summer of July and August to educate the people about these changes. And we're also going to need the time for the market to respond because right now with the COVID situation, there's a shortage of building materials to do decks and repairs. So it can, I can't imagine anyone would be able to build anything because of this, uh, the, the shortage of lumber supplies right now. And I think that we need to uh, prepare ourselves for a construction demolition debris policy in regards to how much you can put out if you're going to try and do this kind of stuff. Uh, I think we need to prepare ourselves um, uh, accordingly. I don't mind using the summer to educate the people on it and perhaps have a, a date of perhaps September the 15th if we're still having our scheduled for the period. Uh, have that as our targeted public hearing date. Okay, just a, a note on that, that an agenda review, we looked at dates and I think that the 15th of September is the date we're not going to have one. We're going to have three in September and that would be the first uh, deputy mayor, I believe, or Jacques, I think it would just, and Cheryl and we're going to the first, the 22nd and the 29th. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, Councillor Austin, did you want to speak on this? Uh, no. Councillor Outhead? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And as I said the first time I spoke, uh, the concern over the process doesn't mean we don't support the, the end goal. 
and this council has approved thousands and thousands of units of uh, of new units over uh, my time on council and even in this last term. So of course we all want to grow and we all want to deal with the housing situation. However, I think you know what we saw at community council last night, what we saw council uh, tonight, regional council is very different than dozens or hundreds of people wanting to speak to us on an issue. And I think there's a lot more to be gained from a public hearing that's different experience and greater value than just sending in an email. Uh, as we've seen today, we had 150 people send in an email that wasn't accurate because they didn't understand. So I agree with Councillor Hensby when we say we have some educating to do over the summer and I think that perhaps staff will be able to figure out a way to do this, but uh, I, I can't really see how we could deal with hundreds of people right now, but perhaps I'll be uh, I'll be enlightened. There was two things I wanted to follow up with. One is, uh, Jill, over to you because you said that parking wasn't a consideration. Well, parking should be a consideration off the peninsula where you can't walk to things and when you don't necessarily even have transit in all areas. So we are going to have to think about parking when it becomes to our run suburban uh, neighborhoods. In my opinion, we can have that discussion, I suppose, when this comes back next time. The second thing is, and this is a question for, for John Traves, is I understand we received permission to hold virtual council meetings. That's great. We've been doing that and it's been working well. I do not get the impression that we had to hold them. In other words, all meetings have to be held virtually now. We got permission to hold virtual meetings. Uh, what I'm hearing, John, if I misinterpreted you, we couldn't try and do some kind of a non-virtual one now, go back to it with social distancing, with whatever for 50 or 100 or 200 people at a time without permission of the minister. That is not my take of that at all. Saying that we were allowed to meet virtually is not the same as we're saying we're not allowed to meet in person. John? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. So just to clarify, the Minister issued a direction under the uh, state of emergency that effective at 2 p.m. on March 22nd, 22nd Council must, or sorry, let me, I'm reading that in, discontinue holding their meetings in person. Mm -hmm. Instead, only virtual meetings may be held by video or telephone. So the Minister has actually directed that there be no uh, meetings in person and that they all will be held by telephone or virtually. Okay, all right, so that went further than I thought, but we could actually reach out and ask for a change to that, I would suppose, as, as we keep opening up things. But I just think if we're going to deal with hundreds of people and trying to educate people, that we might have to have several public hearings, and if someone could be in person, that's great, or if not uh, virtually, that's fine as well. But uh, I think it's very different than uh, a situation where there's like we saw last night and again tonight where there's no opposition and, and not a whole lot of curiosity. So I guess what we'll do is I'm certainly going to support this going forward right now, but then uh, Mayor, is your understanding that the agenda review will then come up with uh, with planning on how, how and when this is going to be handled? Yeah, just to be clear, I, we don't really talk about public hearings at agenda review very often. They They are determined by council and then the, the the ads go in, Cheryl, on the public hearings end. But in this case, we would take it upon ourselves at our agenda review meeting, probably of next week, uh, John, to look at the options and determine whether it's multiple meetings that we have or what the options are uh, to ensure that we would do this the right way. I, I uh, as much as an optimist I am, I don't see us having public uh, meetings um, with people gathering for some time. All right, thank you very much. Well, John? Yeah, just to just to to be to reiterate, Mary, you're absolutely right. Uh, agenda review essentially uh, sets the dates. We don't we don't discuss matters at all. It's really a, a, a question of what what matters will come. And and as you said, the clerk's office will bring forward the proposed dates. Usually, they set these, and then we will look at it from there. So that, that's it. And and you were right. Um, just to the councillor's point, though, um, once we've opened a public hearing, we will, you know, as is the normal course, uh, continue. Um, if, if need be, um, we will adjourn for an evening and until we've heard from all of the individuals who wish to be heard on the matter. Thank you. Uh, councillor uh, Stretch. <coughs> Thank you, Worship. And uh, 
Look, of course, I'll be voting for this tonight. And I, I didn't mean to be a wet blanket earlier on the issue. I just wanted to express uh, some concerns. And, uh, and quite frankly, after having my supper and a big strawberry shortcake, I feel a lot better anyway. So if you guys are up for it, I'm up for it. And as long as John and staff can uh, make sure that if uh, one of us drops out, and I, I've seen a lot of you on this screen drop out too, uh, uh, that there are provisions for that and we wouldn't be excluded uh, prematurely, then, uh, you know, I, let's, make, let's make it happen. I'm with you. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure that when you dropped out earlier, it wasn't to get some strawberry shortcake, uh, Councillor Stretch. Uh, I might have been tempted myself. Maybe um, so. If I wasn't stuck here without anything to eat. Uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm sure that the public hearing that we will hold about uh, backyard and secondary suites will be a little bit more uh, engaged uh, with the public than uh, the one we had tonight and the one we had last night at uh, Northwest Community Council. Um, so I have no doubt that we will have a number of people who are coming to join us. Um, I do have a question and this relates to subdividing the lot. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, residents here got in touch with me a little while ago and said, what if we have a backyard suite and then someone wants to come along and subdivide the lot such that that backyard suite is now the uh, main building on a second lot? Um, do we have a uh, provision to prevent that or is there is there something that we can do to uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen? Jill, do you want that one? Are you still with us? Yes, I'm still with you and I can definitely take that uh, through the mayor to through the mayor to the councillor. Um, so if, so, if somebody did want to subdivide a lot where a backyard suite was located, that backyard suite would need to meet the requirements of, remain, of a main dwelling within that zone. So if the setbacks don't quite meet it, they may need to apply for a variance in that sort of situation. There would be that ability, but they either would have to have the variance granted or it would have to meet those setback requirements. Okay, beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Um, I am simply... Uh, looking for this this is a uh, this is phenomenal that this is back here with us and uh, the goal of this is to make sure uh, is, is to try and legalize some of these things that we know are not legal is it going to be a perfect uh, set of uh, amendments no it's not I don't think we have any bylaws that are perfect um, we will be able to revisit them if the public hearings happen and they show that there are deficiencies we will be able to revisit them and so i don't see i don't see any challenges with opening up the public hearings or proceeding with this process so that we can um, make sure that we try and increase the housing stock at this point we have an awful lot of places that are unregistered secondary and backyard suites and we have uh councillor cleary mentioned uh one percent vacancy rate across hrm we have half a percent here in Lower Zackville, and that effectively means we have zero. Um, so with with the eviction restrictions being lifted in the in the next short order, the housing crisis that we have is going to be even higher than it has been. People are going to be booted out and they don't have any place to go. This will allow some of that to happen. So, so I look for uh, your support uh, for this uh, for this motion. Thank you very much. Okay. Seeing nobody else wishing to speak on this. Thank you to staff. Jillian, thank you uh, very much for joining us today and for your answers and to everybody else. And uh, we'll go to the question. Councillor Shortcake, uh, Counts Councillor Stretch. For the motion, Your Worship. Councillor Hensby. <coughs> Councillor Carson. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Can't hear you, Sam. <laughs> yes, from yes. Councillor Austin. Councillor Austin votes twice, two thumbs. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason, I don't think is with us. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zerowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Councillor Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Uh, virtual yes. 
and uh, the mayor's a yes as well. So that's carried. And uh, so John, uh, Jacques, uh, the deputy mayor, and everybody else at agenda review will have a conversation about this and uh, take the concerns of council into account and let you know uh, our way of proceeding forward. Uh, fair enough, John. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, colleagues, then that passes. We move to motions. First one in the name of Councillor Zarowski, 12.1 is a day of peace 2020 in support for the abolishment of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I will first put the motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 declare August 6th, 2020, a day of peace and support the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons appeal for the banning of all nuclear weapons. Number two, direct a city hall clarion be rung 75 times as bells for peace at noon on August 6th to commemorate the tragic 75th anniversary of the atomic bomb, a bombing of the Japanese cities of Nagasaki and Hiroshima by the United States of America. Three, allow the creation of removable chalk outlines on the Grand Parade to commemorate the tens of thousands who were killed in the first and only deployment of nuclear weapons in war, that Grand Parade be a place of gathering in responsible, socially distant silence. And four, request the mayor on behalf of the council to write a letter to the federal government in support of the abolishment of nuclear weapons. Second. Second by Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll speak briefly to this, if I may. Um, this is something I've been thinking about for quite a while, and we have an incredible legacy in Nova Scotia of, of peace and the abolish, uh, ab abolition of nuclear weapons in our world. Um, Cyrus Eaton, a great Nova Scotian helped found the Pugwash Peace Conferences back in the early 50s. And Pugwash has been synonymous with anti-nuclear world peace. And this is not an anti-military. We recognize the need for a very healthy military in Canada. We support our armed forces and services. But this is looking at nuclear weapons never being used again and to abolish them. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is a long one. This uh, previous council in HRM has supported a day of peace and I would like to institutionalize this one on the 75th anniversary. And um, I think it's an important thing. It is um, something that resonates with many of our new Canadians. And I, I think that it also um, resonates with many on council. So I ask you for your support and um, hope you will support me in this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Your Worship. And I, <clears throat> I just have a, a couple of questions about this. You know, declare August 6th as a day of peace. I, I'd like to declare every day a day of peace, to tell you the truth. Um, it says, and support the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. What does support the international campaign mean? That's the first question. The other is with regard to the bells for peace. I'm fine with that. Number three, removable chalk. Um, we've seen people come up with unremovable chalk, if you will. Um, but I'm a little concerned that we'd be promoting an event whereby we, we can't ensure or guarantee that uh, social gathering would occur. And then the uh, the mayor writing a letter to the federal government um, supporting the abolishment of nuclear weapons. I, I think that's more of a symbolic thing than anything, given that um, chances are a letter from our mayor is not going to change the way the Canadian military works. So maybe if, if Councillor Zorowski could just uh, you know, explain what he means by the support component and also number three, how we can assure that this will have some social uh, distancing. Um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. 
I'm going to ask Councillor Zorowski to hold on just for a sec. We'll hear from Councillor Karsten as well, and then I'll go to Councillor Zorowski if he wishes to uh, speak to that. Councillor Karsten. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Councillor Zorowski certainly knows that uh, I support everything he puts forward. <laughs> um, there may be an exception, okay? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, all we can do, I say to my colleagues, is vote. Uh, certainly our conscience, but uh, uh, support what or vote in, in, in the sense of uh, what we feel is right. Um, a couple things. Number one, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask uh, that the motion be split. Uh, there are a couple of these that, uh, whether they're symbolic or not, that I can and will support, uh, like number one, uh, no harm, no foul. It is symbolic in many ways, but uh, it's a good symbolism. The, the main just uh, is two things actually for me. Number one, you know, we talked early on, again, Councillor Zorowski, you know that uh, uh, this is something you've promoted and by and large council has bought into. When we talk again about evidence-based decisions, you know, when, when we say, oh, have the mayor write a letter to the federal government to support abolishing, that's one viewpoint. We don't have a staff report in front of us giving us different points of view. So are we really voting in terms of evidence based or is it just one group's opinion? We don't know the federal government's opinion. We don't know really what their rationale is for never abolishing nuclear weapons as, as, a, as a nation. One of them I would dare guess is that if we send a letter to the, to the federal government, uh, their concern potentially could be, well, what about the nuclear ships that come into Halifax uh, from the U.S.? Many of us were on board the uh, the, Frank, uh, the USS uh, Franklin, I believe it was. Is that the name of it? The aircraft Eisenhower? carrier. Was it the Eisenhower? Uh, Eisenhower. 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 Sorry. Eisenhower. Yeah. Eisenhower. Somebody um, like that. So, you know, and, and I'm not saying it's not the right thing. But we don't know the other side of the coin. We have no idea the kind of uh, intelligence that the federal government may have uh, in regards to us being part of NATO and God forbid that anything were to happen, but we all know that it's the United States of America that would largely protect us. Uh, and I'm not in a position, I don't think, to just arbitrarily say as a council, well, we have a motion that will support Again, no reports, no understanding really of what the Canadian military's position is and why. Uh, so I feel very uncomfortable. You know, it, it leads me to say, and again, I said this the second last uh, council meeting I was, I was, uh, uh, I attended, that you know sometimes when you have no skin in the game in terms of uh, everyone's understanding that I'm not uh, reoffering. It allows you to say maybe a few things publicly that you wouldn't otherwise say. One of the things over the 16 years that I've had the greatest difficulty with is when other levels of government interfere in our business. I can go back to a member of parliament uh, that's not currently a member of parliament uh, involving himself in a cell tower issue that was very clearly at the time municipal. Um, you all know and have heard stories about uh, several of us, uh, uh, not pointing out any one in particular, but including myself, that have had uh, members of other level of governments trying to interfere in our business uh, and happen to be provincial representatives. So, you know, without more information, I mean, if, if we were, if this was really our issue to make a decision on, would we make it? I would guess not. So I would, I would say what Councillor Adams said, the whole thing is rather symbol symbolic again, uh, because we, we don't know, as I've said before, what the federal government's real rationale is behind uh, staying with their policy. But I, I would suspect as Canadians, we have to have some faith and trust in our federal government to make those decisions and then not allow municipal governments to, in my opinion, interfere in those decisions. So. I would certainly support number one and uh, 
number four, uh, number, no, I would support number one and uh, uh, I'll figure it out here, uh, number three, okay? But uh, look, vote the way you have to. Uh, you know, I, I, this hasn't, this isn't the first time this has come forward. Uh, there have been groups that have asked uh, uh, former mayors to, to sign things disallowing the states to come into our Halifax Harbor uh, uh, with nuclear weapons. I don't know how even our East Coast military would feel about that. You know, doing exercises with them on a daily basis and uh, our troops very heavily involved with theirs. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily want to be in a position to uh, influence that decision one way or another. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Uh Just briefly, and uh, I'm glad we're breaking this down into uh, segments because there are portions of this that I certainly would be happy to uh, to uh, support. Uh, just for when if Richard comes back to speak to this, just a little bit more clarification on us writing to the federal government about abolishing nuclear weapons. Canada hasn't had nuclear weapons since the 1980s. No. So uh, I, you know, and so I'm just want, looking for a little bit more clarification. I mean, if we wanted to talk to NATO, if we wanted to talk to the UN, but writing to the federal government to say abolish weapons when they haven't had them in you know 40 years, I'm just a little confused by that. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to weigh in on this too in support of Councillor Zorowski before I go back to him for more questions. I don't, we'll split the questions. I have no problem with each of them. Um, I remember when I joined Mayors for Peace a month after I became mayor, I called uh, the local admiral at the time, John Newton, and I said, look, John, I'm going to join Mayors uh, for Peace. I'm not looking for your permission. I just want to let you know because I have such great respect for the military in this community. <clears throat> and he said to me, uh, your worship, nobody knows the value of peace more than the men and women who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. I'm pretty sure Canada has uh, campaigned against nuclear weapons and, and weapons of mass destruction and has written letters on their behalf. We're not a nuclear power, as Councillor uh, Outh had said. Um, we're not saying in this thing that we uh, wouldn't allow uh, nuclear submarines or uh, vessels to come into our harbors, although that's a discussion that we could have at a further time. Um, I do think it's uh, on this, the anniversary of the bombing of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that I think that uh, I, uh, I think what Councillor Zarowski is doing here, in my view, passes uh, all the tests. And is it symbolic? You know what? Thank symbols you. really matter. If there's anything we know in the world right now, it's that symbols matter. Um, and if your actions follow your symbols, that's even better. So, um, from my point of view, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's good. Councillor uh, Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm supporting. You know, the the theory and stuff is good, but I just want to read some of the stuff. In uh, regards to some of the international website, uh, the I, I can w org, whatever, and said, the only thing I'm worried about is, will they go after us to ask that we affirm ourselves a nuclear weapons free zone? That's what they did in Toronto and a couple other things. And that's where I have problems of how far does this agenda go in regards to affecting our relationships with NATO and our in, 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 the, in our and our sister ports. You know, we are we are the teamed up with uh, North Fork, Virginia and, and other places as well that have a lot of military presence. Will, will U.S. ships or will our NATO uh, brethren allowed to bring in their their nuclear powered weapons, their nuclear powered ships or even the, the sh their ships that may even have nuclear weapons on them? Uh, so the question is, is that what I read before me is fine, but it, it's the devil's in the details. And are we going to have to be asked to sign on for a for a nuclear free zone? And I don't want to do that. So. Uh, I'm in favor of this as long as that's as far as we go. Thank you. Right. Well, the motion doesn't call for that. That would be another step if it was to come to us. That's not what this motion uh, calls for. Um, I get your point, but I think that this motion is uh, uh, is not there. Councillor Stretch. Just quickly, uh, just quickly, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Zorowski spoke to me about this a couple of weeks ago, and, and I understand where he's coming from. And uh, I guess on its face, when you read this, you know, uh, I, I asked Marilyn a minute ago about the, the, the uh, and I asked her a lot of times about how I should vote. Uh, but quite frankly, who wouldn't support the abolition of, uh, of nuclear weapons? So, I mean, uh, by virtue of voting, uh, you know, one way or the other, you, you may send the wrong signal. At the same time, 
I hear clearly what uh, Councillor Hensby and uh, uh, Councillor um, Othet were saying. I, I don't want in any way to put uh, the harbour of Halifax or us uh, uh, in a strategic spot um, uh, relating to uh, uh, aircraft carriers that may come in that may have uh, uh, you know weapons uh, that, are, that that may be seen to be in opposition of what we're saying. So I'm asking Councillor Zerowski as well to clarify. Uh, for the most part, I think I could vote for all of those. I mean, removable chalk, uh, the bells ringing, uh, day of peace, uh, you know, really, uh, I don't see a big problem, but I don't want to put us in a corner like uh, several others have said. So just look for clarification, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll attempt to, uh, to clarify. Uh, the declaration of uh, day of peace is just that. Um, as as Councillor Adams said, I wish every day was a day of peace, but in in our world, that's not to be. Um, we have flashpoints happening everywhere, and uh, hopefully that this will just lend the support of a small city in a global scale to say we wish a day of peace for everybody and support the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. That's it. Nothing more. Um, so, so that's part one. We don't want nuclear weapons. And even the scientists who developed them um, at the Manhattan Project spoke out against them. They were terrified. And when we see how much more powerful the hydrogen bombs are than the original atomic bombs that, that killed the inhabitants of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, um, it's, it's a frightening prospect. So to wish for a day of peace, I think, is pretty, pretty tame. Um, it is symbolic, as the mayor has said, as is the ringing of the carillon uh, 75 times. This is the 75th anniversary. And I still think back to the anniversaries that my father looked back on with great trepidation at the end of the Second World War and looked at the wreckage in his eyes that, that war has created. And so this is commemorating the useless deaths um, from the detonation of nuclear bombs. And I think there's plenty of evidence, with all due, due respect, Bill, um, there is so much that has been written about the deleterious effects of those detonations and how bad it would be if nuclear bombs were to be detonated. That's basically... Um, what the ringing of the bells is about. I hope with every fiber of my being that we never have to have that occurrence again. The removable chalk outlines is symbolic again. It's there to commemorate those who are no longer there. These are people who were vaporized and died of radiational poisoning. We don't want that again. And to write a letter to say that we support the efforts of the federal government in support of the abolition of nuclear weapons is just that. It is about the support. We are not abolishing nuclear weapons. We are supporting the efforts to make sure that we never have these things lying around. Right now, my greatest fear is that a rogue country like North Korea will detonate and and, and we will see the results of that. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of, I wish they weren't around to have to debate the ramifications of whether we would then go to the next step. That has nothing to do with this motion. This motion is a commemoration, a wish for peace, and a wish for the abolition of nuclear weapons and a small act on our behalf to write a letter in support of those in the federal government who would support the abolition of nuclear weapons. And it's been a tradition all the way back to Prime Minister Pearson to seek peace. He won the Nobel Prize to seek peace rather than weapons of war. Thank you. Okay, call it. Uh... Councillor Karsten. Just a few more comments. And, and certainly, you know, uh, 
make no mistake, uh, and I say this to all of my colleagues, if they were gone, Richard, today, yesterday, don't forget, like yourself, you come from a background that you have a direct relationship to loss through war, World War II. I, you know, so it's it's not about me being a warmonger or me thinking that this is great to have nuclear weapons in the war in the world. What it is for me is so near and dear to my heart. Is jurisdictional. Why would we want to? And and Mr. Mayor, this this goes against what you've said as well just now. But that's okay. We can have a good uh, sound debate. You're saying that the government of Canada has uh, supported the abolition of nuclear weapons, and yet no names mentioned. I was just sent an email uh, from uh, an organization that states at least, I don't know this to be factual, why? Because we don't have the support or the report. We're going on a motion that just says, look, you know, let's see if the federal government will support the abolition of nuclear weapons. It goes, it reads, Canada supports the retention and potential use of nuclear weapons on its behalf, as indicated by its endorsement of various, various alliance statements of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, of which it's a member. Canada has not signed or ratified the Treaty on the prohib prohibitation, prohibitation of Nuclear Weapons. It did not participate in the negotiation of the Treaty of the United Nations in New York in 2017. If that's wrong, Richard, it very well may be. I don't believe it to be. But how? My, that's my point all throughout this. We don't know the federal government's position. Why would a council in Halifax, Nova Scotia, want to weigh in on something that in reality is the federal government's responsibility? Thank you. We did sign the uh, comprehensive uh, nuclear uh, test ban treaty um, around 2000. We were signatory to that. Um, you know, from my point of view, I I don't uh, I'm not going to. People can vote whichever way they, they wish. We're not asking the government to give up something that they have. We're not a nuclear power. We don't use nuclear uh, weapons. We're just asking them to advocate on our behalf. But people can decide which way they want to go on it. And uh, we can divide the question up into four and we'll, that's what we'll do. Councillor. Uh, um, I'm having computer problems. My computer may crash. I think it has something to do directly to do with Bill. <laughs> Councillor Adams. So if I do crash, I vote yes in all all four. Thank, you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and, you know, I, I, I um, oh, don't shortcake. My mom made some. I'm just waiting to get that. Um, so you remember what Thomas Edison said, don't believe everything you see on the Internet. Um, but I, there's something here. Canada voted uh, against the UN General Assembly resolution that established a formal mandate for um, states to commence negotiations in 2017 on a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. That resolution that starts as, um, I'll just bring it up here, and it says the resolution adopted uh, taking forward multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations. So Canada voted against that. And, and here we're getting them to, you know, we're asking them to uh, support uh, the, 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 you know, banning them and i understand you know councillor zarowski have an immense amount of respect for for councillor zarowski and i understand uh why this is um uh why he's brought this forward i get that but councillor carson said it, it's a bit outside of what we should do and and who knows what it'll lead to i mean i'll support um the day of peace i get that i like i said i wish every day was peaceful uh we're not there yet someday maybe um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's split, and we'll we'll have a look and see how the vote goes. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Um, so I'm wondering if we can. Is is the fourth one that it, can we um, can we vote on the first three together, and then no. vote on the fourth one separately? No. No. Okay. 
All right, we're going to vote on number one first. Are you ready for the question? Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Can't hear you, Sam. In favor. Councillor Mancini. <laughs> In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason gone. Councillor Smith. Councillor Smith. Councillor Cleary. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Zarowski. Four. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell? For the motion. Councillor Outhead? Yes. Uh, Mayor Savage? Yes. Number one passes. Number two, Councillor Stretch? For the motion. Councillor Hensby? Affirmative. Councillor Karsten? Can't hear you, Bill. Sorry, I, I put tick marks in the wrong spot and didn't look at them. I will support uh, number two. It was actually, if I could change my vote on the first one, it was a no. Okay, Councillor Karsten was a no on the first one. It still carried uh, Councillor uh, Cheryl, I think. Councillor Karsten was a no on the first one, a yes on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nickel? Yes. Councillor Austin? In favor. Councillor Mancini? Yes. In favor of the motion. Uh, I don't think Councillor Mason is with us. Councillor Smith. Councillor Cleary is not with us. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Zarowski. Four. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. And Councillor Outhead. Yes. Uh, Savage is a yes. That passes, Cheryl. Okay. Number three, <laughs> Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason is not there. Councillor Smith. Councillor Cleary, Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Zarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Count Deputy Mayor. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Yes. Councillor Savage. Yes. That passes, Cheryl. On number four. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Against the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Against the motion. Councillor Mason. Smith. Councillor Smith. Councillor Cleary. Councillor Walker. Against. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Zarowski. For. Councillor Whitman. No. Deputy Mayor. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Yes. Mayor Savage is yes. <laughs> Cheryl, that's to pass. That motion's passed. Okay, colleagues, so that we've dealt with that. Uh, Deputy Mayor Blackburn, can you take the helm? I have to uh, duck out. Yes. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Yep. You'll get some uh, shortcake, Mr. Mayor. Going out to get some shortcake? <laughs> yeah, I'm going out to the Muscanabin Valley to get my share, to be honest with you. So, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be so here. A good, uh, a good Dartmouth uh, person who made that shortcake. I'm, I, oh, I, I hear that. 
I hear that. Um, <laughs> Laura, I just want to make sure we got quorum. We're, we're still good to go. We're missing a few people. If I duck out, we're still okay? Yes, we still have quorum, Mr. Mayor. Okay. And uh, folks, before I go, I do want to just again uh, thank uh, Laura. I think, Laura, that this is your last meeting for a while. Uh, I'll be here next next time as well, Mr. Mayor. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I won't say anything good about you then. <laughs> okay. <thank> you. <laughs> Until next time. Colleagues, I'm going to duck out and I'm going to uh, leave you in the capable hands of the Deputy Mayor and of Cheryl here in uh, uh, my office and uh, I will talk to you on council in two weeks and I'll probably talk to most of you before that. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Cheryl, I don't have the uh, the benefit of being in the uh, in the room with you, but uh, if uh, you need me for uh, anything, uh, just uh, give me a, a shoot me a text. All right. So uh, five seven nine seven one six four is the uh, is the phone number. So uh, just let me know if you need anything. Uh, moving on to uh, twelve point two. This is also Councillor Zarowski, the uh, HRM participation in COP twenty six conference in Glasgow, Scotland, in twenty twenty one. Councillor Zarowski. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you. And um, I would like to move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report examining the process to register Halifax Regional Municipality as a participant for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, COP26, which is Conference of the Parties, which was to be held in Glasgow, Scotland, this coming November uh, 2020, but has been postponed because of COVID, uh, the COVID crisis until November 21st. The staff report shall include a recommendation of what is most appropriate, the most appropriate level of participation at COP26, the number of delegates, staff and council to be sent, uh, associated costs and participation with other levels of government and NGOs attending. Uh, as you, uh, we have a seconder for that. Sorry, a seconder. Second. Yeah, please, All right. I second that. Councillor Nancy is uh, is on for second, and uh, go ahead, Councillor Zareski. I always get ahead of myself. Get ahead of myself. Uh, my computer is really acting up, and I'm getting an echo, so I'll do the best I can. And if I disappear, I'm obviously voting for this um, as I reboot my computer. Yeah, I, I was hoping that we were going to be able to attend COP25 in Barcelona, and it was not to be. Um, forces out of our control to which we had requested support had denied us the availability and the ability to attend. And I think that as the second city to declare a climate emergency and the fact that we have now implemented and are in the process of revolutionizing how municipalities deal with climate change through our Halifax 2050 provided by staff. Uh, at the last uh, regional meeting, I think it's time we attended as a full delegate. And there are plenty of cities that attend as full delegates, and it's a place of consultation and of learning, both for staff and for councillors who would attend. And I think as we move forward in climate change, it is the number one concern that we have as a city. It means we have to change how we do things. As we green the city, we have to learn as quickly as possible the best routes to do this, the most cost efficient routes of doing this, the total cost of doing this, and send the appropriate people there so that we can learn from how other people are doing. And so whether this is a cyber conference or will be held the way we're holding our meetings now, or whether in 2021 we'll actually be able to travel there, I think it is a very important event, especially as we embark into the new era, the era of how to mitigate the effects of climate change on our city. And I view this as something that's very important. And the reason for it is to take control of our environment and to recognize that we are the leaders in this. As a municipality, we are leading so many others. As the second city to declare a climate emergency and consult with 
all sorts of groups through our staff on how to mitigate this, I think this is the next step. And I ask you to support me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Zarewski. Uh, list of speakers starting with uh, Councillor Whitman. Councillor Whitman, sir. Uh, thank you, Deputy, and uh, thank you, Councillor Zarewski. The irony is not uh, missed on me for flying to a climate change uh, conference and sending yourself and staff. Um, I support your, uh, your movement. Um, I'll support you to uh, attend virtually and send staff virtually, but I just find it very ironic to, uh, to fly a delegation uh, overseas for this, so I won't be able to support this. Thank you. All right, th thank you, Councillor Whitman. Uh, any other speakers uh, wanting to weigh in on this? Seeing nobody else on the list, uh, yeah, Councillor Zarowski. Yeah, yeah, if you so want to close. Go by yeah, sailboat, so is, Richard. Pardon me. He said, "Go by sailboat." <laughs> did you want? To, did you want to uh, close? Yes, I did. Um, I'm having trouble with my computer. Um, this is for a staff report. This is not to send anybody. This is a staff report to evaluate the costs and the most expedient way of doing this. And if it's via internet, fine. If it's via something else, that's fine too. But this is asking for a staff report. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, seeing no other speakers on the list, uh, Cheryl, if you want to, uh, well, I guess we'll uh, call for the question. Question. Uh, all right, question is called for, Cheryl. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Carson. For staff report. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason is not present. Councillor Smith. Councillor Smith is not present and Councillor Cleary are, is not present. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Zarowski. Absolutely, for it. Councillor Whitman. For staff report. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Not easy being green, yes. And Mayor Savage is not present. That motion is right. passed. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, so that uh, that wraps up the uh, uh, the in public portion of our program. But uh, we do have a couple of items in camera. Um, just wondering uh, what uh, folks would like to do if they would like to go in camera. Whether uh, th this is something that we could perhaps deal with uh, in uh, in public realm. You can probably improve the minutes, Madam Deputy. That's, that's what I was thinking. If I could get somebody to perhaps move the uh, the in camera minutes, we could deal with that here in public. I move the in camera minutes. Second. All right. Moved by Councillor Nichols. Seconded by I believe that was Councillor Austin. All right. And Councillor uh, Walker. Walker. I'm sorry, sir. I uh, do uh, Cheryl? Do we need to uh, vote on this in uh, in public? Uh, yes. The minutes. Please. All right. But we do, uh, do not, we just need a, um, hands. Oh, show of hands then. All right. Um, show of hands for the minutes. Looks like everyone is in favor of that. Anyone opposed? <coughs> Seeing none. All right. So the in camera minutes of uh, Special Regional Council April 2nd, 14th, 28th, 2020, and the Special Budget Committee meeting of May 20th and June 9th, 2020, they have all been passed. Um, we do have 13.2, a property matter. Uh, is this something perhaps that we can uh, deal with out here or shall we go in camera for that? Well, Madam Chair, if this is my item. I need to amend the motion slightly to add four words to it. Hey, in camera. Need, need to All go right. in camera. And so we will, uh, uh, we'll... you know, and this matter has been going on for some time now. I'm afraid to even speak about it publicly because it, it should be municipal property. Oh. Get, so. uh, we should probably move in camera for that. Um, but before we move in camera, should we do notices of motion? Sure. All right. Any notices of motion out there? Uh, 
Um, looks like uh, we've got a notice of motion on behalf of Councillor Mason that needs to be read. If uh, perhaps somebody could uh, grab the screen and have a have a look, see, and uh, move that notice of motion, that would be awesome. Councillor Mancini, do you want to take that? Once we can hear you, there we go. I'm stuck here. <laughs> Laura's put it up on the screen there. Yeah. So, uh, Councillor Mancini, we can uh, hear you. But I'm, um, well, I'm stuck and frozen. Oh, okay. I can okay. read it, Ms. Dep Deputy. You got it, Sam. All right, go for it, Councillor Austin. Thank you. Uh, take notice of the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council to be held on July 21st, 2020. I propose to move first reading of, propo of proposed bylaw D500 respecting district energy, the purpose of which is to establish and operate the district energy system located within the Cogswell district energy boundary, among other criteria outlining the district energy system service area, service connection criteria, and authority for enforcement. All right, thank you very much. Any other notices of motion? All right, seeing none, I guess uh, we will uh, conclude here and uh, go into our in-camera uh, meeting notification. And uh, that's earlier on in the uh, in the calendar, is it not, Laura? Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor. So all members of council should have an in-camera appointment in their Outlook calendar that they can go to. All right, excellent. We will exit here and see you there momentarily. Thank you very much.
Laura, we're back now. Hello. Thank you. I don't believe you have quorum, though. Okay. <clears throat> we had 11. Richard, you're not muted. <laughs> He's not even sitting down at his computer. <laughs> He's gone to get a snack. <laughs> well, I think the only order of business is an adjournment in any event. Uh, yeah. Thank Deputy you. Deputy Mayor, uh, we did just uh, get quorum. We have nine. We now have quorum. All right, if you want to send us live. And you are live. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I'll call one last time. Did we uh, get everybody's notices of motion? I believe so. All right. If there are no further notices of motion and uh, no further business, uh, thank you all very much. I uh, move to adjourn, Madam Chair. We, <laughs> we have a, a move to adjourn. Thank you very, very much. Our next meeting is on July the 21st, I it do is. believe. Yes, uh, time to be determined, but uh, we will see you all on the 21st, if not before then. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.